So everybody has, uh, you know, in the room has read the book, and, and uh, we're we're ready to go. Maybe we should give them a test. Uh -oh. And there will be a test. So just uh, by way of introduction here, uh, this is Herb Fraser right here. Herb, you want to raise your hand? Herb is the public relations and marketing manager for Magnolia Plantation. Uh, he's um, served as a reporter or editor for five daily newspapers in the South, including his hometown paper, The Post and Courier. I think this is right, but Herb was the first African American in the newsroom at the old News and Courier circa 1973, I'm thinking. No, I was actually the third. third. Just say it. Yeah. Third. Third. <laughs> third. Third. Yeah. third. Okay, but it was 73. 72. 72. So, uh, I, I, you've got to be precise. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bernie Powers, uh, who some of you may have, have you had an opportunity to have a class at the College of Charleston with Dr. Powers? Uh, Bernie's a professor of history at the College of Charleston. He's the author of Black Charlestonians, a social history. He's also the chief historian of the strategic plan for the International African American Museum. Uh, he's uh, uh, also uh, served as an evaluator at the African American Focus Tours at Drayton Hall Plantation for the National uh, Trust for Historic Preservation, and that's um, and for any of you know who, for any of you who know Bernie, that's just scratching the surface of his tremendous contributions to all of the material really that we're talking about when we're talking about Charleston's plantations and museums, you know, Bernie's had a, a key role in, um, you know, in the creation of uh, uh, historic Charleston. And then there's Marjorie Wentworth, who is South Carolina's Poet Laureate. Uh, Marjorie uh, also serves on the faculty at the Art Institute of Charleston, and she's published uh, several books of poetry and she's had uh, a number of her poems nominated for the prestigious uh, Pushcart Prize. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to our, our authors. And um, uh, you know, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick question again. What's our total time? So, um, the class technically end at 6:45, okay, so and there'll be a couple people, a couple people who need to leave early. We won't take it personally. Yeah, and and um, but just you know, as long okay. leave, leave plenty of room for conversation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I just so we'll. I think um, probably one of the things you're curious about is just how we even came together to write this book. Um, so we'll we always start with that and. and I have a feeling since you've read it, um, I don't think we've ever spoken to an audience where they've read the book. <laughs> You're an audience now. Um, so that's really going to be kind of interesting for us. So we'll probably learn as much as you will tonight, if not more. So um, it started, um, as do most of the projects I'm involved with, it started with poem. So I can actually hand this around because it's a small group. Um, I don't know how many of you were here the, in, on, in June of 2000. Okay, so this was a, a, a pullout section um, in the paper, and Adam Parker, um, our arts editor, called uh, the day after the shooting and said, you know, they're opening Emanuel Church on Sunday for services, which just boggled the mind. Um, and he said, uh, we need to. We want to address that and have sort of a pullout section in the paper with the Palmetto Roses, and they wrote beautiful, sort of small biographies of each of the uh, Emmanuel Nye. He said, and we'd like a poem to go down the back, but you know. Um, so that was that, and the next morning I got up and started working on it, and the uh, had the TV on, right? We all had the TV on all the time. That time uh, during that period, and um, the bond hearing was going on, um, which I think impacted what I was thinking about. Um, I'd also been to the first sort of community event at Morris Brown Church on Thursday. Um, I couldn't get inside, but there were just as many people outside as inside, and I saw the way everybody was sort of taking care of everybody else and giving you know, there were all these policemen giving out water, people were holding each other up, people were praying together. 
um, and it really um, struck me that I felt better after being there with uh, and um, so anyway I wrote this poem and I found um, a, a speech on YouTube you know of Reverend Pinckney um, talking I think after Walter Scott was killed and he said only love can conquer hate so I used that as a, an epigraph and I wanted the poem to feel like a prayer since it was going to be in the paper on Sunday so um, and the poem somehow led to the book, and I'll explain it. So it's, called, it's called Holy City. You all know why. So, uh, again, only love can conquer hate. Let us gather and be silent together like stones glittering in sunlight so bright it hurts our eyes emptied of tears and searching the sky for answers. Let us be strangers together as we gather in circles wherever we meet to stand hand in hand and sing hymns to the heavens and pray for the fallen and speak their names. Clemente, Tawanza, Cynthia, Ethel, Sharonda, Daniel, Myra, Susie, and DePayne. They are not alone. As bells in the spires call across the wounded Charleston sky, we close our eyes and listen to the one to the same stillness ringing in our hearts, holding on to one another like brothers, like sisters, because we know wherever there is love, there is God. Um, so the poem was put in that paper and then broadcast on the BBC that night. Um, they used it to, and had beautiful footage of what was going on in the city at the time. And then I went to put it on my website, and it had been taken down. We found out later by a white supremacist group. So um, the South will rise again. Watch out for them if you encounter them. Um, but it's just showed. You know, I've never felt like a poem threatened um, people, but I guess in this case it did. It's just kind of interesting. Uh, it took a long time to get it back up, and two people working about eight hours to get it back up. So anyway, a lot of people saw this. I think it was on. PBS and all this stuff. Anyway, people saw it and heard it, and, and um, a woman who does some promotional events for us said, you know, you should write a book about this, and I'm like, I don't think so. She called the next day and said, no, you've really got your heart in it, and you're there, and you should write about it. So I called her, and um, I also was working with an agent at the time who'd seen me read the poem on TV and was very moved and was interested in, in, in something more. So. Well, I was uh, very surprised to hear from Marjorie. We hadn't talked in a while, and Marjorie and I had worked on a project at Magnolia. We had a um, poetry contest, and she was one of the judges for our poetry contest for adults and youth. And I met her uh, uh, face to face and seen her. And, and so, and then, of course, you know, when the poet laureate of the state calls you, mm -hmm. you that wakes you up. <laughs> <laughs> we like to tease her. They <laughs> also tease me about my. Um, all, my non-existent Boston accent. <laughs> <laughs> so she called. So when she called, and I thought, and I said, "Wow!" Of course, you know, I spent the first 14 years of my life in Manuel. In the night the tragedy happened, my daughter called me at 10 o'clock. My youngest daughter called me, and she said, "Daddy, there was a shooting at your church." And just those words. You know, stunning, stinging words. What do you mean? And so you turn on the TV and you find out what happened, of course. Now, of course, not much was known at that time. So I jumped in the car with my wife, we drove down to John, down to the city. We were living on James Island at the time. You get down here, and when you could see all the police lights and the ambulances and everything, you knew something had happened. And then you listen on the radio that they had not apprehended a suspect. And then he said, well, maybe is this the safest place to be? So we turn around and go back home until the dust settles. So when Marjorie called, you know, from the time of the tragedy to Marjorie's call, you know, you're kind of in a state of disbelief uh, and wondering what can you do. And Marjorie's call made it clear this is what we could do. Uh, and what, as you read the book, what I brought to this collaboration was experiences 
but my experiences were based more from my childhood. And as a journalist, I'm always reminding I all, I'm always reminding myself a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. So I had the experiences of growing up in Emmanuel, interacting with the minister, one of the most prominent ministers in the church's history, Reverend Benjamin Glover. He baptized me when I was 12. I had the experiences of interacting with uh, Reverend Hilda Scott. If you know them, you've read the book. You, you saw what we wrote about Hilda Scott. She was one of the strong members of the church, one of the women in the church. Um, but I also had the experiences of the neighborhood. So I went back and I interviewed some older pe people who were adults at the time. They helped me. This is how I remember Ansonboro. Now the neighborhood, you know, was Ansonboro Housing Project or that area east on the east end of Calhoun Street uh, where the Gilead Auditorium is now. And so I also wanted to find out, you know, about the school where I grew up, remind myself, am I remember, remembering this correctly? So I talked to my sixth grade math teacher, Walter Brown, who lives east of the Cooper. Uh, went back and, and, and talked a little more uh, in detail to my uh, aunt, I'm not, I'm sorry, aunt, but my cousin, Ruby Martin, who was there that night. And if it was not her decision to leave and go home, she could have been among the people who had lost their lives. So there are several people who I touched, you know, to try to make sure that my memories were correct and describe the neighborhood, describe the church. Now I knew, based on when at the time Marjorie called, that I had those experiences that I could bring to uh, this collaboration, but I knew that I lacked one one, one thing that was very important to help tell the story, and that is an understanding of the AME Church. Uh, as a child, they didn't teach us about the history of the AME Church. Uh, I didn't learn, actually, the, of Denmark VC until I was a, a journalism fellow at the University of Michigan, and I, uh, and I was studying the history of Charleston, the Civil Rights Movement, uh, and I came across this realm. I didn't. I, I was stunned. Uh, so I knew that we needed someone in this collaboration that had that knowledge of not only Charleston's history but also the history of the church. And I uh, interviewed Dr. Powers a few times as a journalist, and so I knew of his ongoing uh, research that he'd been doing in the AME Church. So he would be the key guy to have on his team, and. I called Bernie and he said, yes. He took on the test. Yes, yeah, yeah, right, right, that's right. And uh, I, was, I, was, I was very surprised to hear from, from her on this matter, you know, just kind of out of the clear blue sky. Uh, I've known her for uh, almost 25 years, between 20, 20 and 25 years. And, uh, and we've worked on this thing before. He's interviewed me. We've, we've been on programs together. But, uh, we had never written anything together. Uh, he's, he's written about me. I've misquoted you. <laughs> no, no. Oh, oh you yeah. You've been, you've been after. Okay. And uh, uh, and I had I had met Marjorie, but I did not really know Marjorie well. She was an acquaintance. Uh, uh, I had seen Marjorie around and met her once. So it was uh, it was a challenge. Uh, to think about, but I didn't have to think about it long, and uh, I sort of said I immediately, virtually immediately agreed to this. And um, uh, I, I am uh, tied into the story in a number of ways. Uh, I'm a lifelong uh, AME, uh, not a member of the manual, but Morris Brown right around the corner. And of course, our, uh, we uh, as a congregation came out of Mother Emanuel. In 1866, so we're we are at least in terms of antebellum, uh, excuse me, postbellum uh, history, just about as as old. Um, and, and you know, Herb Herb said something that I want to point out now before before I forget it, and that is in in the course of of doing the work for the book, and even subsequently, because we're continuing to learn things about the people that we discuss here. But we, we, we encountered a number of people who just
just in the course of talking with them, told us that, yes, they ordinarily would have been there that night. Uh, they intended to be there that night. But something came up. And they happened not to go. And it is, it's, it, it is, uh, it's just very different. It's just very different uh, when you encounter uh, those stories, the people that you know, uh, who might have ended up as a as a part of this, but they weren't the subjects because of the decisions that they made or the decisions that were made for them. Really small, arbitrary things. Yeah. Like, yeah. I was really hungry. Yeah. Air conditioning the air, broke down. Yeah. One broke. woman actually got a license to minister that evening, right. and um, her air conditioning. You remember how it was so yeah. hot, you know? And, yeah. But just yeah. those. You know, and how can you know? Yeah. At the time. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so I, um, I came on board, and uh, we divided this project up into parts, really into thirds. So uh, most most of the uh, most of the chapters that are substantially history, uh, I I have written those. But please keep in mind that we all offered one another extensive uh, and very rigorous, pointed, constructive criticism, and 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 everybody really has has weighed in and done a part of really virtually every chapter. And, and the fact of the matter is now, when we look back at the book, sometimes for some of the some of the chapters, particularly those that are not uh, so much historically driven, we'll have to ask ourselves: Did, did you write that paragraph, or did I write that? Yeah. Because, you know, we can't remember, and you can't can't really. At Which least is we're good. Yeah, 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 and that's a and that's a good thing. So, uh, but 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 we knew that uh, when people heard that 